Okay, folks, it's time to start again for the last block, the last one and a half hours. You can do it. Isn't it amazing how quickly the day goes by? No, you have a headache? <laughs> they don't think it's that quick. <laughs> All right. So, one and a half hours left. We can cover a lot of interesting things in that time. And the topic now is um, focusing on this combination of continuous and categorical latent variables. We've had uh, some uh, limited examples of that already, like allowing for a uh, residual correlation between items. But now we're going to put it into a more organized framework. And we're going to focus on two things today. Uh, mixing, con uh, blending, blending continuous and categorical latent variables in the factor analysis setting. And we're going to talk about something that we call factor mixture analysis. Uh, we're also going to talk about mixture factor analysis. And I'll tell you the difference between the two. And um, you can see it as a generalized factor analysis or a generalized latent class analysis, depending on which angle you come from. And we're also going to briefly uh, mention the structural equation mixture modeling. The third bullet, growth mixture modeling, we're going to wait with until tomorrow where we go longitudinal. But I just want you to be aware of the fact that the ideas that we have talked about tomorrow in growth mixture modeling are already uh, begun, are already Im implemented, uh, the basics of it, in the factor mixture analysis model. Which is an example the, of the fact that uh, things get progressively easier as we go forward, not harder. And it's also easier because I keep repeating myself here when I talk about these models now. I'm going to do quite a lot of repetition here. We're going to talk about categorical latent variables on the left and continuous latent variables on the right. And we're going to imagine that in both cases we're working with dichotomous observed variables, dichotomous indicators. And here again now you have the uh, model, modeling story that we brought up in the context of ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity, no, <laughs> AD attention hyperactivity, yeah. I'll leave that aside. Anyway, you know the story. Now you look at this diagram and it looks like a very easily interpretable uh, latent class model, right? You wish you got these kinds of item profiles. And you're going to see that we actually see them at times. And you already know everything that there is to know about that model diagram. You have a latent class variable. And uh, you assume that you have uh, uh, correlations between the items explained by, or associations, I should say more generally. The associations among the items is explained by the categorical latent variable. And the categorical latent variable is defined to be such that it is the only reason that these variables are associated. Uh, which is the same thing as saying that you have conditional independence. The items are independent given class membership. And once again, I want to hasten to add that that does not mean that the items are uncorrelated. So I don't want you to come to me and ask me, I don't believe, I don't believe in the latent class analysis model because my items are correlated. You know? And we hear that often. The items are strongly correlated because they are influenced by one and the same latent class variable. The independence is within class. Given that you are in, say, class four, the items are uncorrelated is what this model says. Now, if you have a lot of direct effects from X to several items, uh, they may not be conditionally independent just because they're influenced not only by C, but by X. So if you condition on C, they're still correlated due to X. So having X with direct effects takes care of some of the violation of conditional independence. I should also mention something that came up in the break here. Somebody asked me, sometimes I get f a lot of fixed thresholds, fixed at uh, high or low values. Is that bad? 
And that's not bad because look at class three here. Here the uh, thresholds are very low and therefore giving a probability of one uh, so that if the, the thresholds are low enough, you would have exactly probability one of endorsing all of the inattention items if you are in class three. That just makes the interpretation more easy. So thresholds fixed at high and low values, which M plus does automatically when they get large, is not bad. It actually helps the interpretation. And that happens particularly when you have polytomous uh, ordinal indicators such that for some classes, not all of the indicator categories are realized in the data for certain classes. Anyway, so this model is now standard LCA with an X and potentially direct effect. But let's ignore the direct effect aspect. So then let's go to the right screen. And again, the items are dichotomous. And the picture on the left then is uh, y-axis, the item probability, and now we're going to have a continuous latent variable on the x-axis. So the fact, there's a factor f, a continuous latent variable, which influences the response to the items. So now you go back to the first slides that we went through uh, and think of logistic regression here. This is logistic regression. That is, uh, the probability that the item gets endorsed is a function of the factor. As the factor increases, the probability of endorsing, say, item four increases. And here we see that the items differ in not only in their thresholds or intercepts, but also in their slopes. So as the factor increases, item four's probability of endorsing item four increases slower than items one, two, and three. So there are two parameters, the intercept and slope, where again, intercept can be translated into negative threshold. So this is the um, situation of item response theory, IRT, also called latent trait theory. All it is is lo uh, logistic regression of the item on the factor. It's just that the, f so the factor is a covariate, right? The only thing being that it is latent, not observed. So we draw the picture as on the right, factor <coughs> with, your, with the four items. So this is now, this arrow represents one logistic regression of item one onto factor F, a continuous covariate, albeit latent. So it has an intercept and a slope and can be drawn like this S-shaped curve, like in the coal miners, smokers, non-smokers situation. Each of the item has its own intercept or threshold, that is, <coughs> and its own slope. Typically, in IRT, you have only one latent variable, one factor. Typically, in IRT, you don't have an X variable. So in topic two that you have on our website, a video, we talk about IRT a little bit more and describe how this kind of modeling uh, relates to standard item response theory, which is used in educational measurement and testing. Typically, you have no X variable, and typically you assume that the, the F variable is uh, uh, a normally distributed factor. Typically, in IRT, F is an ability, ability, ability to solve a certain item, an educational item, say a multiple choice item. Now, <clears throat> these two models can be tested on data. So if you have um, a set of diagnostic criteria for, um, uh, say, um, substance use of some kind, substance use problems, you will have a set of diagnostic criteria dichotomously scored. And uh, the question is, <coughs> is the model on the left more suitable or the model on the right? And the model on the left has the advantage that you get a classification of individuals into different classes. Uh, but 
the model on the right allows for uh, a continuum to be represented, perhaps a more fine-grained picture. On the other hand, you don't get any uh, classification of individuals. It's true that you can say that individuals who are higher than a certain threshold here, a certain high value on the factor, people out here are, have a problem and those who are below don't. But the data will not tell you much about the cut point. Even if you estimate the factor scores, you will not easily see a natural cut point. Whereas this model <coughs> works, uh, produces cut points, produces a classification of individuals. So uh, over here then you allow for the correlation between the items through a factor and their correla the correlations among the items is higher when the factor loadings are higher and when the factor variance is higher. <clears throat> if you know your factor analysis, you know the correlations increase by the factor loading size and the factor variance. So that's just a repetition of what we've done. Linda applied these two models for the alcohol diagnostic criteria and found that the factor analysis model, although with two factors, fit the data better than the latent class model. So now let's, let's get to uh, a new model. We're putting all of these on the same slide. I'm going to stand the other way, actually. You have uh, the three models again here. You have your big modeling picture here. Say that you work with two classes for simplicity, starting at top left. <clears throat> Individuals who have a problem and don't, that don't who don't have the problem, and you draw the latent class model like this. And to repeat what we said, the uh, description can be given in the following way. If you take a pair of items, J and K, they are strongly correlated because they're influenced by the same latent class variable. As long as you have at least two classes, they are correlated. If you only have one class, they're uncorrelated. If you only have one class in the latent class model, that says that the items are uncorrelated. That's a pretty uninteresting model. But for, say, in this case, two classes, you say that within class, the relationship between the items is nil. There is no association. That's the definition. If you go to the factor analysis case of the IRT or the latent trait case, uh, you have a continuous latent variable making them correlated. Uh, there's not an interesting picture to draw. We can ignore this picture here. What about, as somebody already suggested, uh, what about combining the models? Well, let's consider that. I don't know if this blocks. You can look down to the left here. The podium might block some of you. Uh, you have, I'll point over here. You have both a latent class variable uh, influencing the items and a factor, continuous variable, influencing the items. So one way to understand that is to look over on the left here. So you still have two different profiles, high and low. And that is uh, handled by the latent class variable. The latent class variable influences the items, shifts the probability up or down, depending, by the, of the, depending on the class, up or down. That's what these arrows do given the latent class flavor to the model. But then we speculate that there is variation among the individuals even within class. So in class one, uh, there may be individuals who have a rather low, comparatively low tendency to endorse the item. And some individuals in class one have a relatively high tendency to endorse the item. So you have this severity variation which uh, has been of interest to um, diagnostic researchers. They feel that sometimes these classes are too broad. There is too much heterogeneity among individuals within a class. And here's a statistical attempt to pick that up, that idea of further severity variation within class, within each of the classes. So that is then handled by adding a factor variable, a factor that influences the items like this. It says that uh, the probability of item, J, item one, say, 
is influenced not only by being class one versus class two, but the, for increasing severity, the item probability increases in line with the IRT model up there in the middle. So with the increasing severity here, probability increases. That's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that factor mixture analysis generalizes the latent class approach uh, in the sense that you no longer have to have a model that specifies conditional independence, flat regression lines, but you can allow for conditional dependence. So positive within class lines, that is you allow for within class correlation among the items. So you know, even when you are in a certain class, there is another variable which makes the items correlate even within the class. So there could be reasons why item responses are more similar <coughs> for individuals within the class and the reason is uh, the severity variation within the class. So this is more general. You can allow for positive correlation. It's a model that has been used in uh, a genetic context in microarray uh, analysis by McLachlan, the same McLachlan as in the McLachlan and Peel book. And he argued on substantive genetic grounds that it would be more realistic to allow for this degree of estimated within class correlation when you seek um, to find these latent classes or clusters of individuals. He actually did a, an exploratory factor analysis model within each class. So an exploratory factor analysis mixture model, which we now have, since a couple of versions, have incorporated in M plus. So you can actually do exploratory factor mixture analysis. It's in one of the uh, chapters in the user's guide. And we have also worked hard on um, making it practical to do maximum likelihood analysis of factor mixture models where the items are not continuous, as in McLachlan's case, but categorical or, or otherwise non-normal. And uh, apply that to, to uh, different kinds of uh, data. Um, I should say that my experience to date is that this model typically beats the models above it. This model typically has a better BIC than either the factor analysis IRT model or the latent class model. Uh, it's a little bit more complex to interpret, but um, it often comes closer to the data and uh, it's, it's a model that I think you should consider. And like I said, it's also a model that ties directly to, into the um, models of growth mixture modeling that we'll talk about tomorrow, where F is corresponds to the growth factors. And there are many variations on this theme, and I will actually show you a, another summary page uh, after Linda has presented a couple, two examples on the factor mixture idea. So I'll turn it over to her now. Okay. Okay, so we're going to, on the right screen here, this should look familiar. This is just a repetition of what we've already looked at, but just, so we're going to be looking at this, the data, the alcohol dependence criteria again, and we looked at the LCA model with three classes and the factor analysis model with two factors, and now we're going to look at the FMA model and see how that fits the data. So if you remember, um, we use BIC for a relative fit, relative model fit. And with our LCA3 class model, we have a BIC of 28,539 with 29 parameters. And we improved the BIC with the factor analysis model with two factors. And if you look at the F factor mixture analysis, two classes, one factor, 
with the factor loadings invariant, um, the BIC with 29 parameters goes down to 28,370. So implying that this facts, factor mixture analysis model is a better fitting model for these particular data. Now we can also compare with respect to absolute fit of the data, looking at standardized bivariate residuals and standardized residuals for most frequent response patterns. And as we've said earlier, you obtain these by asking for tech 10 in the output command. So here we have um, standardized residuals for um, various uh, observed frequencies. So here we're looking at our standardized residuals for the latent class, three class model, the factor analysis, two factor model, and the FMA, one factor, two class. And these are for the response patterns, I believe. So for example, I told you in Tech 10, we can look at univariate and bivariate residuals, and then also residuals for the response pattern. So for example, we have nine items here. A response pattern would be nine zeros if, ever, if a person endorsed none of the items, nine ones if they endorsed all of the items, if they endorsed the first three, it would be one, 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 and the rest zeros. So there's a certain combination of response patterns available, and we look at residuals for each response pattern. And what you see here is that for, and the residuals are standardized, so we're looking for values, absolute values greater than 1.96. The observed frequencies are shown in the first column, estimated frequencies in the second column, the fourth and the sixth, and the residual in following those. And you'll see that we have three residuals for three response patterns that have like 600, 200, and 150 observations each for the latent class model. For the factor analysis model, we also have three large residuals. They are for a smaller response pattern, for response patterns with smaller frequencies. For the factor mixture analysis with one factor and two classes, none of the residuals are larger than 1.96, they have an absolute value larger than 1.96, which would imply that these fit the data better. The factor mixture analysis, one factor, two class model fits the data better than the other two models that we looked at. So let's take a look at how we would set this model up in M plus and see what's new here in the input. So I think there's nothing new until we get to algorithm equals integration. And when you have maximum likelihood estimation, which we have here, and categorical outcomes with a continuous latent variable or a factor like we have in the factor mixture analysis, we, re we need to use numerical integration to estimate the model. So that's why we have this. And each factor is one dimension of integration. So in our situation, we'll have a single dimension of integration because we have a single factor. You can see we, uh, the starts have been increased. And then the ST iter is, has a default of 10. So this is the iterations for the initial stage analyses. So for these 200 random starts, usually we just do 10 iterations for each of the 200. And here we've increased it to 20. And it's the second number, the 10, that we carry to complete analysis. And we've turned ad adaptive quadrature off. The default is that it's on and that sometimes it just works better without, with it off. You can see that we have the option processors. Processors equals four. So if you have a computer with multiple processors, then you definitely should use that option. It will 
speed up your analysis considerably. So just, there's one other thing that we don't show here that will also speed things up. So if you have multiple processors, if you put after the number of processors, parentheses, starts, end of parentheses, then that, in addition, spreads the random starts across the multiple processors in a way that also makes things even faster. So you might, for those of you who are running analyses that take a long time, you might want to make a note of that, the starts setting of the processor's option. Oh. Okay, so let's take a look now at the model command and see what we have. So we've, what we've done here is to our latent class model, we've added a, a continuous factor, and we refer to that as F. And the buy option, so this is the first time you have seen the buy option, is short for measured by. So we needed a way in M plus to name the latent variables. So we name the continuous latent variable F by saying F measured by X1 through X9. And we give a starting value in the second line, F starting value of one. You don't have to do that, but that's just to show you what that is. And you'll notice in square brackets, we refer to means, intercepts, and thresholds. In this situation, we're referring to the mean of the factor F, and we're saying, we're fixing it at zero. And the reason we're doing that is because in the classes, we, so in the class-specific part of the model command, we are freeing the thresholds so that they're, set, they're different across classes. That when you have a continuous factor in the model, the default in M plus, whether it's multiple group analysis or multiple classes, we hold the thresholds equal and the factor loadings equal across the classes or groups to represent measurement invariance. So when we relax the assumption of the thresholds being equal by mentioning them in the class-specific part of the model command, then we have to fix the factor means to zero in all classes for the model to be identified. So that's why that's done. And um, if, so this, this model has the thresholds unequal across classes, factor loadings equal. If you were starting this analysis, you might want to just start out with the default model, which would be F by U1 through U9. And in that case, not have any of the other statements here as a first step. But we're sort of showing you the final step. And then to go through the output. And there's quite a lot of output. Do you want me to go through pretty much? Okay. Hmm? Briefly, okay. So for, for both of, for each class, we obtain our results for the factor analysis, F by, and we have the factor indicators here. The estimates are logits because in the regression of the factor indicators, which are binary on the factor, which is the factor model, and with maximum likelihood estimation, we get logistic regression coefficients here. And you can take a look at this to see which of the items are most important. For example, U9, U5, you know, carry more weight in this severity factor than some of the other items like U2, and I don't remember exactly which they are, but <laughs> you can look back at the thing to see that. So we give you these results, and then we give you the mean of the factor, which remember we fixed to zero in both classes because the thresholds which we show here are not held equal across classes, and then we give one more thing that's important here, and that's the factor variance. 
So we estimate the factor variance in each class. And you can see there is significant variability. And then we have the ident I'm just going to go through this. I guess I'll do it on this screen. The same thing for class two. So for class two, we have the factor loadings, which are the same as in class one because we held them equal. We have the mean zero because we fixed it at zero because the thresholds are allowed to vary. And then the factor variance, which is larger in class two. Categorical latent variable means just simply tell us how many convert into the probabilities of how many people are in each class. So we get the means for the, for the one category of the variable. And this would be translated into the probability where we see lat latent class membership. So that's just simply related to how many people are in each class. So then this is a plot of the classes for the two class one factor model. So you see, if you remember back to the classes we saw in the three class model, we had a high class up here where, you know, people were kind of going like this. And we had this class that had the two items that were particularly high. And then we had our lower class where larger was the only item that had a probability that was very high. Here it was larger and major role hazard like drunk driving. So by adding the factor, we've gotten rid of the high class and instead we've ended up with a problem class, which is class one, and a non-problem class basically, which is the class two. And the so the factor then varies within class. So within the problem class, people, I would imagine, have higher severity scores. You know, they start higher and go higher than in the normative class, which probably has lower scores. But so taking into account the factor, the severity factor, reduces the need for that third class and perhaps get, and seems to fit the data better than trying to depict that as a third severe class. So that's my very untheoretical interpretation. <laughs> so so we're going to now look at another example of this type of analysis. And this is an analysis that Banked alluded to before, but this is a UCLA clinical sample Banked has worked with of 425 males ages 5 to 18, and they all have been diagnosed ADHD. And they were assessed by clinicians, by direct interviews, and by interviews with the mother about the child. And then they were given nine inattentiveness items and nine hyperactivity items that were scored dichotomously. And the children included needed to have at least, the family had to hit, have at least one ADHD affected child. So we w wondered what type of classes of ADHD would come out of this analysis using the inattentiveness and the hyperactivity items. And on your right screen are the items themselves. So, I mean, they're pretty clear. The inattentiveness items is difficulty sustaining attention and easily distracted, hyperactivity, fidgeting, difficulty remaining seated, blurts out answers, etc. So this is just there for, for your own information. Now we looked at several different models. The LCA, two class, three class, four class, five class, six class, seven class. Now if we look at BIC, the lowest BIC indicates three classes, but if we look at the BLRT results, which are in the last column, then that would indicate six classes. So we took a look at the plots 
And so if we take a look at the three-class solution, we see we have one class up here that seems to be high on all the items. And then we have a class that's high on the inattentiveness items, but is low on the hyperactivity. And then another one that is higher on the hyperactivity and somewhat lower on the inattentiveness. When we look at the six factor solution that the BLRT suggested, it really is hard to see anything very clear about the classes. So based on that, we decided to look at, the, to settle on the three class solution. And then what we did is we did an EFA. So what you see here is what you already saw, but at the bottom is what's new. It's a two-factor EFA, which has a considerably lower BIC than the three-class LCA. So it, it, seem, it seems to fit the data better, but does not really give us information on classifying children as hyperactive or ADHD. So then we went on, and so what's new on this slide is at the very bottom. So then we decided to do an, an FMA two class two factor, and then, and that one was with measurement invariance, measurement invariance being thresholds and factor loadings held equal, and then also an FMA two class two factors with class varying factor loadings, so where the factor loadings are not held equal across classes. That's a little uh, complex there. The, uh, you have a lower BIC for, the, uh, for this model where uh, the, the factor loadings are invariant, but you shouldn't always, you should not always listen to BIC, because this, <laughs> we'll tell you that now at the end of the day, right? When you have, these two models are actually nested properly, oh, yeah. and this model has class varying factor loadings here, they're the same. You can actually test right. those two models against each other by a, lo a likelihood ratio test. So in the corner here is the result of that test, and that test found that this model using that, whole, having the measurement invariance makes the model fit worse. So we decided to look at this model where we don't have measurement invariance. And it still has and, a better BIC than the other model. Exactly, and it still has a better BIC than the EFA and a better BIC than the three class. Okay, so let's take a look at these three models that, the three new models that we've considered over here and see how they look, how they compare to each other. And that's another good thing to do. If, you, if you're doing all these things and you can't see the progression and how it makes sense that it goes along, then probably something's wrong. So here was our original three-class model where, or here's a three-class model where we have high everywhere and high on the inattentiveness, low hyperactivity, and high hyperactivity, relatively lower inattentiveness. And then the sixth class we decided didn't really make sense. But here, and the question I guess that people have is, is there really a hyperactivity class? Or is it really only inattentiveness and hyperactivity is just something else that these children exhibit? Or are hyperactivity is there a hyperactivity class that is different and that's predicted by different covariates than the inattentiveness class? So here what we would see is that we have a class high on everything and a class high on inattentiveness, low on hyperactivity, but we don't find the hyperactivity class. The green one here doesn't show up. And it seems that the factor in this factor mixture analysis with 
or I think there were two factors actually, that those factors seem to take into account the hyperactivity dimension and remove, remove that from, from this. And although we have the hyperactivity is low here in the inattentiveness here, so it's more an inattentiveness class and a just general ADHD class. I think you should say more about that since it was your study. <laughs> So just to uh, say a few more words about these two examples. Um, indeed, as Linda said, uh, there are two factors here, and uh, they're very, they come out very clearly as an inattention, inattentiveness uh, factor, severity dimension, and a uh, hyperactivity is very clear, two-factor solution. And in fact, um, you can specify it as a CFA, confirmatory factor analysis model. You don't really need the explorator EFA cross loadings. It's a very simple structure for those of you who are familiar with factor analysis that is used. And it, it seems like by introducing that those factors, the severity that allows for within class correlation uh, between the items, simplifies the picture from the uh, three class to uh, a, a two class phenomenon, which then is of substantive interest because Psychiatrists are, are really debating whether or not the in a, uh, whether or not the hyperactivity only class really exists, and it doesn't seem to uh, exist uh, when you use this treatment sample. At least, it's not a general population sample, but a treatment sample. When you go to this model, the FMA model, factor mixture model, that um, seems to uh, fit the data better. Now, in this first example that Linda went through, you ended up with uh, two classes and one factor, one severity dimension, and here the severity dimension had loadings that were invariant, whereas over on the left they didn't. So the, over on the left, the severity dimensions were slightly differently defined in the, in the two classes. But here, uh, you don't get the uh, uh, problematic, the class with uh, al alcohol problems of all kinds, that is the overall high combined class doesn't show up here. But instead you have the peaks here of uh, drinking larger than you intended and major role which is dominated by items having to do with drunken driving. So this high class really does look like an abuse class. And in fact, um, although you have uh, severity dimensions uh, which makes a probability of an item like tolerance, uh, possibly going up quite high. And, and if you do these plots of FMA results, you really should have uh, severity bars plotted here, say plus minus one standard deviation on the, in terms of the factor variation. Uh, but I think this illustrates the fact that in general population surveys, it is very hard to capture an alcohol dependence Wow, thunderstorm coming here. It's very hard to capture a um, dependence class. You know, depend, alcohol dependence or any dependence is supposed to be dominated by high probabilities of withdrawal and tolerance. Those are the two hallmarks of dependence. And I think it's very difficult in a general population survey to actually measure those. People misunderstand them. Uh, withdrawal is, is confused with um, uh, nausea from uh, hangover effects, for instance, which is not necessarily uh, an indication of alcohol dependence. So may maybe in this sample at least, and this survey, this result which points to uh, an abuse class of various, of varying severity and a normative class, no alcohol dependence uh, class, may be a reflection of the difficulty of measuring alcohol dependence. At least that's how one can reason about these results. Now I want to show you um, a few more slides drawing, uh, taking this further into more generality. <coughs> Excuse me. And in doing so, I will get into um, an issue that we will only briefly talk about today, talk a little bit more about tomorrow, and that is um, categorical, on the left screen here, slide 177, categorical outcomes plus continuous normal 
latent variables have the computational and statistical disadvantage of heavy computation due to numerical integration. So, Linda alluded to something called numerical integration, which we don't know what it is, but it is something that's uh, an algorithm to produce maximum likelihood estimates and the need for that comes combination of maximum likelihood, continuous latent variables and categorical or other non-normal variables. Those three things together gives you a need for numerical integration and if you don't remember to say algorithm equals integration in the M plus input, M plus will tell you that uh, you need to say that. That leads to heavy computations. The more factors you have, the, the heavier the numerical integration. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end of tomorrow, I believe. And that's the computational disadvantage and the statistical disadvantage is that of having to assume normality for the continuous latent variables. And having to assume any distribution for latent variables is much more serious than having to assume uh, distribution for observed variables. For instance, for observed variables, we know that normality assumptions can be made and estimation can still give good results. Point estimates are good and you can correct for deviations from, no, from normality by computing non-normality robust standard errors and test of model fit. Uh, we'll talk about that in topic one. But when it comes to latent variables, you're more dependent on the assumption. So there is a way out of that that's called non-parametric approaches, non-parametric latent variable distribution. Uh, using a non-parametric latent variable distribution avoids the normality assumption and at the same time the computational disadvantage. So we put an exclamation mark on that so in line with chess that's a good move. So that leads us to this um, wallpaper of models which is from the, uh, that hybrid paper that I mentioned to you. And here we have a thunderstorm in Berlin. It chased us from Sweden where we were surrounded by water for one week. And we're almost hit by lightning. So this comes from that hybrid paper, the 2008 chapter in the mixture book. We'll have the reference a few slides forward. And you can talk about, um, at this point we've seen so many models you need a little classification scheme whether you want it or not. And here's an attempt to, to sort of structure the modeling opportunities. First you go from the top, you ask should your model have measurement invariance? And we go down the yes uh, path first because uh, we typically want measurement invariance. And then you have a factor analysis emphasis. And then you ask, do you want a parametric factor distribution by which I mean should you assume normality, yes, or should you not assume normality? Normality gives you mixture factor analysis. Note that that is not factor mixture analysis. <coughs> and you will see the difference in the four diagrams that are coming here. So the leftmost arm here, mixture factor analysis, you have a factor analysis model and then you have C pointing to the factor. What does that picture now at the end of the day tell you? C pointing to F says that the mean of the factor varies across the classes, right? So that corresponds to the picture bottom left. This is one class with a low mean, another class with a high mean. Within each class you have a residual arrow saying that there's variation in the factor within class. So you have a little variation, lower, less variation for the low class, more variation for the high class. Note then that that's all you need to say for following this path. Now let's go down measurement invariance, yes, but not a normal factor distribution and talk about this non-parametric factor analysis. That looks like this, very similar to what's on the left, but we have left out the re little residual here and therefore you can characterize the factor distribution by histogram bars, in this case four bars corresponding to four classes. So this picture is saying that the mean of the factor changes uh, by class, so low, higher, higher, higher mean. So these are the means of the factor. 
But within each class, there's no variation. Everybody sits in the same bar. There's no bell shape curved around it. So here you have a way through mixtures to, to uh, characterize the factor distribution. The spacing on the, on the factor axis is done by the factor means varying across classes. The height of the bars is characterized by the class probabilities. So a lot of people in the, this bottom class and fewer people in the high class. This is a non-parametric approach. So if you don't want to work with normal distributions for latent variables, you can take this non-parametric approach and in the user's guide you have examples of how to do that. Now if you go down the measurement invariance no path, then you're leaving the factor analysis emphasized a little bit and you're more into cl cluster analysis. More into cluster analysis. When I say cluster analysis, I, I also then include, um, I, I specifically think of latent class analysis. So let's go down the uh, parametric factor distribution, that is parametric means say assuming normality for the factor, yes. Then we have what, what we just talked about, factor mixture analysis. So look at the picture here now. It's the picture we talked about. C pointing to the items, changing their probabilities or their means across classes, but allowing for within class variation in the severity and therefore allowing for within class correlation like we show here. What's the difference between this picture and the pictures on the left? Just to help you think about these. That's right. Over here, we have C pointing directly to the items. And actually, in this case, C does not point to F. So in this case, we said, Linda said this, uh, well, she said the uh, item probabilities change across classes and therefore we cannot also identify and estimate factor mean differences across classes. So we cannot have arrows from C to the obs observed variables and an arrow from C to F. That arrow would not be identified. But in the picture, I'll take a, pause there for a second. But on the pic, in the picture on the left, you have no arrow from C to Y, which says that we, these two pictures have no arrows from C to Y, which says that you have measurement invariance, right, across the classes. No direct effect says measurement invariance across classes. That means that the item probabilities in the categorical case are the same. Uh, those parameters are the same. Conditional item probabilities are the same across the classes. And the change in the item probabilities uh, is orchestrated by changing factor means, which is this path illustrating. So the factor means changing is what changes the uh, ultimate probabilities, not the item probability parameters. You see that? So this is, this can be used, this is sort of mixture factor analysis either parametric, allowing for people who are different means on the factor and measurement invariance, and then you have the non-parametric version of it still with measurement invariance. But this model uh, does not, it's not of that kind. It is concentrating on sorting people into classes, allowing for measurement non-invariance. And in fact, this model often fits much better than these models on the left. Very often, these models are rejected because you don't have measurement invariance across the uh, different classes. Although there are some exceptions of that, and one exception being the growth mixture model that we're going to talk about tomorrow, where you do assume that you have invariance here, same growth shapes in that setting for different classes, but the growth factor means are different and change the means of the observed repeated measures. Now we have one more path to go down, no measurement invariance and not the parametric factor distribution, no normality. So we have the non-parametric FMA, which I don't, I haven't seen used very much. People are catching up with these things. But it has um, 
a possibility of, uh, in some models, actually estimate F on C and uh, in some cases it can be identified. For instance, you could have a model where you have non-invariant loadings but invariant intercepts and you can estimate this factor model and allow for a non-parametric FMA. So there are possibilities here. I don't want to talk about it now because it's too, too technical but it, it, there are possibilities for non-parametric FMA as well that haven't been utilized. And if you want to read about this, you have um, a series of papers. Here is the microarray. Uh, there's a microarray book and uh, in addition to uh, uh, McLachlan Peel book, there's a specific microarray book that deals with factor mixture analysis. Gita Lupke and I have done some work on that and I did two papers. Uh, referring to substance abuse, one in addiction for uh, the Alcohol Institute in, in Washington, NIAAA, and the other for uh, the uh, Drug Institute, NIDA, in, in uh, Washington. So this article I did first, maybe this one is a little bit clearer, talking about alcohol up here, talking about tobacco down here, and here's the overview paper that had that previous picture in it. And you, all of these are on our website. Here's the uh, behavior genetics application. Now, here's just a slide to say then, last few minutes, that you can do EFA, exploratory factor analysis, mixture analysis. You know, when you, when you have, when you go through these models of latent class analysis, factor analysis, and factor mixture analysis, when you come to the factor mixture stage, you probably, you don't usually don't need as many factors or as many classes as have been chosen for the latent class and factor analysis models. So, you know, if, if you can sort of compensate, you need fewer, you need fewer uh, classes if you have a factor in the model and uh, vice versa. So, it, it could be useful to do an exploratory analysis like this one here where you say, you say, you start with two classes and you ask how many factors do I need? Well, you have this EFA, exploratory factor analysis approach that we talk about in topic one, where you first do a one factor model and then a two factor model and the two factor model is exploratory. You don't specify whether your zero and non-zero loadings are going to be but you have an exploratory approach with rotation of the factor loadings to see what makes sense. And that model is then using class varying intercepts and thresholds, which is the model that we, the, in Linda's previous two examples. And class varying loading matrices, so each class gets its loading matrix rotated separately. And res class varying residual variances <clears throat> and class varying factor correlation matrices. So everything is free and exploratory. And this is the example of user's guide 4.4. So that's how you set it up. So that could be useful um, in trying to figure out uh, the combination of classes and factors. So you really have to go and explore all combinations of number of classes and number of factors. Now, um, just a few um, introductory words then about more so we go from um, factor analysis to structural equation modeling. <clears throat> Here you have a model. It now we can get more sparse in terms of uh, presenting the models. So what does that modeling scheme tell you? So we have a, a rectangle here which means we have a set of items, could be a measurement instrument, says Y, so apparently the variables are continuous. We have F, so we have at least one continuous latent variable, a factor. And we have C pointing to F and C does not point to Y. So that says that we have a mixture factor analysis, right? Not a factor mixture analysis. And then we have a new feature here. And that is a uh, 
path model upstreams from C. So uh, C is influenced not just by a covariate, covariate being a variable that's not predicted by any other variable, but it's actually C is predicted by a Y, Y being the notation for a dependent variable. So we say that substantive theory tells us that X influences Y and Y influences C. Therefore, X influences C indirectly, so Y is a mediator uh, in the influence of X on latent class membership, which then influences a uh, latent variable model out here. This is just to show that an example that you can have models in this part of the model, the part of the model that predicts C. You can have a model behind uh, explaining the class membership. And we will see that in the longitudinal setting tomorrow, it will become more tangible and more, more um, understandable in terms of uh, longitudinal examples. But it is possible technically to do this in the maximum likelihood framework in, in M plus. Actually, uh, the idea for this came from a discussion with an alcohol researcher in, in, uh, in Missouri, Ken Shear, who was asking, could we do something about um, modeling uh, variables uh, upstream from C? So we thought for a couple of years about that and how to do that and how to implement it. You know, the algorithms be behind doing the maximum likelihood estimation are quite complex and we're really thankful that we have TMRS Boraho helping us do that right. So we presented this to Ken Shear and said we had solved the problem and showed him this and whereupon he said, oh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> so, well, somebody else could benefit from it. Here's another one. What does this model tell you? Well, you have a factor analysis model for you. So this looks like an IRT model, like the response area model, latent trait model, one single factor influencing a set of binary items. And that factor influences latent class membership. So again, it's not an X influencing C, but it is rather a, a latent variable created by, uh, informed by binary indicators. And then you have a latent class model out here. So it is a structural equation model in the sense that you have measurement models, and you have the structural part, F influencing C. And you have a setup for that here, uh, which you may want to study, but um, I don't think we should do that this late in the day. It will just be painful. Instead, we'll go to slide 194 and allow for a little bit more time for a discussion. That last model has been actually, it's not just hypothetical, it has been used in this article in Biostatistics, a good uh, statistical journal. Now when it comes to um, structural equation mixture modeling, uh, an early article is that by Jadidi, Jagpal and Desarbo in marketing science, as, as an example of uh, the variety of journals that these good uh, statistical ideas appear in. This has to do with structural equation mixture modeling. You can do this modeling in M plus. You can do that modeling in M plus. And here is a good psychometric article by a uh, former student at uh, UCLA. I was in his dissertation committee and I remember how hard he worked on this mixture modeling confirmatory factor analysis. He looked at many of these uh, factor mixture models and and uh, mixture factor analysis models. But it was in the early days and he, he said at the end of the dissertation he would never do mixture modeling again. <laughs> but now, 10 years later or so, uh, he's actually starting again. It ten, takes about 10 years to recover from an analysis of this. <laughs> All right, so with that folks, we've come to the references here and um, it says that to request a Mutian paper you should email me at my UCLA email address. But you know, those papers are now either on the M plus website under papers or they are on my UCLA website which you get to from the, um, from the um, 
M plus website. So you are likely to find all of the papers uh, on those two websites uh, and, and but feel free to email me anyway if you want to. And then you have all, the, all of these general references that we talked about uh, sorted by here you have IRT references for instance over on the left, item response theory references and um, seems to be a little bit biased towards Mutian references and um, well there's a lot to study in this area. So with that let's uh, turn to you and ask if you have some final questions and we have the, um, the microphone here. Whoa, don't fall. Thanks for, the, thanks for the presentation. What I'd like to ask, you've shown a lot of models. We had two classes, maybe two factors. Say you have a situation where you want to model a large number of potential classes, like a large number of symptoms which might predict a diagnosis. Is that, is that possible or does it, it create its own difficulties? Say you had, you know, 50 symptoms or more. So is the question, uh, do we have any specific problems when there are many variables in the analysis? Do you want to take a first stab at that? No. Not really, but I don't, I haven't seen that be problematic. But if you have a, if you have a lot of items and you've worked with them long enough to know which of them are more reliable and more valid measures of what it is you're measuring, then I would say use the better items. So a, a smaller set of good items is going to probably get you further than a larger set of not so good items. But, but I, I think uh, we can handle quite, quite a large number of variables uh, computationally without you uh, having to wait too long. Uh, you know, these models uh, rely on conditional independence quite a lot. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the numerical integration uh, does not really get hurt by the number of items. Uh, it's more number of people in some of these analyses. Uh, so I, I would say uh, certainly a hundred variables could be easily done. Right. And uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't see that as particularly problematic. So it's, and it's also with numerical integration, it's the number of factors, not the number of items. So if you tried to have six factors, for example, that could be problematic. I mean, we recommend no more than four dimensions of integration and each factor is one dimension of integration. And another comment on this, because I don't know if you're coming from a place of experience where you've had a slow analysis, probably maybe not, but a lot of times if your analysis is very, very slow, you are very likely trying to extract maybe too many classes from the data and it may more be a sign of a misfit between your model and data. And if you send that to us at support at statmodel.com, we can give you an, we can look at that in a way that you can't and tell you if that's what the problem is. That's so, an interesting uh, comment because it is true, uh, a very good statistical fit index is computational time and diffi difficulty in replicating the best solution. They are great indicators that you're trying to either fit the bad model or more likely trying to pull too much out of information out of your data there, that is not easy to find. And, and it's fairly easy for us to determine if that's the case. So don't, I always hate it when somebody goes, I've been working on this for three weeks and you know, I feel like, well, why didn't you email me three weeks minus one day ago. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No, because it's no fun just to beat your head against the wall. And Linda tends to answer emails pretty quickly. Yeah, I do. At least before three weeks. Right. I think you have a 24-hour turnaround. Well, I try. So if you send me an email and you don't hear back from me in 24 hours, it's probably gone to cyberspace. So you should probably send me another email. I have two questions. Uh, I'm not sure if the first one is a stupid one. 
you have sometimes p-values are uh, of 999. I don't understand it. Uh, for example, on page 163. 129? Okay, so the question has to do with p-values of 999. Oh, That's p for really good models. <laughs> no. <laughs> What's that? Whenever no, you, nine. Well, anytime you get 999, that means that it was not, something was not able to be computed. So I wouldn't, I can't. Or it wasn't relevant. So you or get it a wasn't p relevant. For example, it was a fixed parameter, right. and a p-value wouldn't be relevant. I'd have to see the output to say for sure, but, um, oh, which slide is it? 163, for example. 163? Fix R can. Ah, yeah. Okay, so, so that's a fixed parameter. In, a, in the factor analysis model, F by, we fix the first factor loading to one to set the metric of the factor. So, so one is a fixed value, so it has no standard error. The ratio is not computable, and therefore there's no p-value. So 999 is our way of saying this is either not computable or not relevant. In this case, it's not relevant. Okay. That's uh, the time. second question, uh, is it in LCA um, necessary that, uh, that there is a balance between the number of items for each dimension, for example, for inattention and uh, hyperactivity? So I think your question is, does the number of factors relate to the number of items? Uh, number of items for each dimension. Uh, if, 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 uh, it, must, uh, it must be a balance between them. Oh, must there be a balance between the number of items per dimension? Yes. Uh, n not, not a very s exact balance. Uh, if, if you know nothing about, I mean, we talk about this in topic one, you talk about EFA and you want to design a measurement instrument where you have enough items to capture each of the factors. And if you go in and do a totally exploratory analysis, a factor represented by, say, only two items may be hard to detect in the presence of everything else, every other factor that is relevant. But uh, the fact that we had nine items per factor here is, is not important. It could be three items on one factor and 12 on the other. Or, or 15 on the other. So that's not critical. Is the solution dominated by one dimension? No, I, I wouldn't say so. No, not in confirmatory factor analysis, I think. I yeah. think it would be dominated in exploratory factor analysis. Well, if, if, it depends on if you go down to two items, I think it would be. But three items, even in exploratory analysis, it, 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 the, uh, the factor with more items would not dominate, no. I think that's more of an issue in um, perhaps principal component analysis. So I don't oh, I see. see that as critical here. Okay. It's a question for slide 175. 175? One. Yeah. I still don't understand why you turned to choose an FMA with two classes and two factors rather than three classes and two factors or three classes and one factor. So is it this? No. no it's yeah, so the question is why do we do two classes, two factor, not two classes, three factor or? No, not, why not three classes because that's what your LCA model suggested. Why not three classes? And yeah. one factor or two yeah. so, factors. So here what you would do, um, we have explored many more factor mixture analyses than shown here. Uh, a first model that I would explore would be two classes, one factor. That is clearly uh, re rejected in favor of two classes, two factors, because you need the two factors. And when, when, when you have two factors, uh, you, you're not going to need three classes. You don't need as many classes as in the LCA. You typically, when you have factors in the model, even if you had only one factor, you typically don't need as many classes as you did in the LCA where there are no factors. I mean, yeah, when there are no factors. And, but of course, you could go forward. What would make sense here is to have, you, uh, to actually test three classes, two factors, and we did that, and that would get a worse BIC. That is, you're introducing more parameters than you need to have. So you would see that in the BIC.
Okay, we have seven minutes left, folks. You have the energy, I hope. More, more. Oh, we have a question right here yes. in the microphones there. <coughs> okay. On uh, 174. 174. I can do it. I wonder, you write that no classification of individuals is uh, obtained, uh, but I wonder, you, you need this, I think? The you idea need a classification? Of, of, yes. So Otherwise, you have no diagnosis of the indiv individuals, what, what they are. Right. So, uh, this argument here uh, that the exploratory factor, models, factor analysis model gives no classification is, is directed towards uh, the psychiatric tradition where they like to diagnose or classify people. And this approach of analysis doesn't give you that end, end result. Now, uh, one can argue you don't need to classify people. Instead of saying how many percent are uh, uh, ha suffering from a problem and how many percent are not, why not give them uh, give a score and see uh, where a person falls in that continuum? And for instance, yeah, you, you, you could go, you could stop with the continuous uh, factor analysis. So this is not a, a general critique, but a critique that's re relevant for dealing with diagnostic criteria in psychiatry. Is that your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because I think the combination is interesting to have uh, factors and classes, but, but if you cannot decide on individual, then the class is only an analytical tool and uh, it's not used in reporting results or... Oh, but here, here, the EFA model here doesn't have any classes. We haven't gone to the uh, classes yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so this is standard factor analysis. Yes. And could we oh. pass the... Uh, I think I can speak about this. Once again, to the slide number 175. Slide 175, a popular slide. Next. Why you picked the last model? Um, because you said a chi-square difference uh, with the degrees of freedom uh, of 16 is significant. But, um, yeah, I don't really get it because the BI big is uh, smaller. Um, I don't really get the logic and you don't really have a chi-square there. Uh, how do you get this chi-square difference and how do you, did you yeah, not... That, not uh, this is a good story, so let's, let's tell it one more time here. So, this is the, uh, this is the factor mixture analysis where the factor loadings are held invariant across classes. It actually gives the best big of all of them. And that's what you're, uh, you're talking about. But this model can be tested against uh, the more general class varying factor loading model. These two models are properly nested and fulfill the assumptions be behind chi-square testing. And when that is the case, I think uh, my own feeling is others may disagree, is that you really should make use of that likelihood ratio chi-square test. So the likelihood ratio chi-square test gives you chi-square of 58 with 16 degrees of freedom, 16 being 75 minus 59, and the p-value is very low, saying that when you impose the restrictions uh, of invariant factor loadings and having only 59 parameters, you significantly worsen the fit relative to the more general H1 model. So this is like an H0 model, more restricted than the H1 model, and the H0 model is therefore rejected and go, you go with this one. Yes, so then uh, my feeling is when you, ha when you have a choice between working with BIC and working with a chi-square difference test, I would tend to favor the chi-square dif difference test. Now other methodologists might argue differently, but that was the argument here, at least, to do it that way. But that's a good point. So there are certain models. I think none of the other models can be compared with respect to a, chi a likelihood ratio chi-square test. None of the other models fulfill the assumptions of being nested and not having parameters on the border of the admissible space. But th these two models do. So uh, then you might use that, the power of that likelihood ratio test.
Yeah, that's a good point. So the question is, if you have class varying factor loadings, you don't, you're not measuring the same dimension in the two classes. It's two different dimensions. So you cannot talk about the same dimension going through the whole distribution for both classes. And that's, uh, you know, that is the uh, problem of non, non invariance. So therefore, you really don't, you're not going down the measurement invariance path in that tree diagram. You really only, you're only most or mostly, you're only exclusively, almost totally exclusively going down the cluster analysis thinking that is cl classifying individuals in the best possible, most flexible way. But the problem is then that you cannot l no longer talk about a single or two single dimensions going through all of the classes because the dimensions are different. So, and, for, that, and, and you can't therefore compare the dimensions across classes yeah. because they're not the same. Exactly. But rather but, within classes you could have different kinds so of So for instance, severity. that doesn't stop you and when McLachlan and uh, the others in the microarray book from Wiley do this, they allow for uh, total uh, non-invariance of uh, factor loadings and they're not interested in placing people on the same dimension. Uh, they're only interested in clustering people. Now, if you read that hybrid article that I wrote, uh, uh, it also refers to IRT modeling as traditions, where people like Bob Mislevy, who used to work at ETS, Educational Testing Service in the USA, he uh, talked about different classes corresponding to individuals using different um, solution strategies. And uh, there, you had um, non invariance of, of, of loadings uh, as well of item, uh, item uh, characteristic curves. Uh, and, but he didn't, want, he, he didn't necessarily compare people on that dimension. So you may want to read that hybrid article and look at his references. But I, I do agree that it complicates the modeling. By the way, there's another paper in the pipeline. I think I referred to this. Uh, 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 a student of mine, Shona Clark, C L A R K E. Do we have it in the reference list? Should be in the reference list. I don't, look at the paper, maybe. Copy. Oh, yes. Slide okay. 203. Slide 203. If you're interested in these kinds of things. Uh, here is, uh, in her coming dissertation, this is almost finished paper, Models and Strategies for Factor Mixture Analysis, three examples. That goes through a lot of different modeling uh, variations and how to use M plus and how to think about models with and without measurement invariance on slide two or three. Shona Clark. And she also wrote another paper that she submitted to the SEM journal relating latent class analysis to variables not included in the analysis. And that's where it comes up that uh, using the known class, as Linda referred to, uh, is only a reasonable, for further analysis, is only reasonable if the entropy is high, like 0.8 or higher. So this paper sits on our website, <coughs> but the second paper is, is, well, it's supposed to be finished when I come back, she said. <coughs> so we'll see. Okay. One more question back there. Yeah. Uh, actually, on the same slide or the next slide, about the interpretation, uh, you said maybe, but I missed. Uh, could you could you explain what happened to the people with um, with the only hyperactivity? How how did the, when we included the factors, they disappeared from the picture? But how would you interpret it what slide? in plain words? Uh, let's. Can anybody find the nice pictures for hyperactivity? It'll be close. There. Here? Yeah. <coughs> so we said that uh, taking a factor mixture approach, clean up the three class solution uh, by dropping the uh, potential class of hyperactivity only, almost no uh, inattentiveness. Instead, then allowing for a factor variation. Uh, around these means in each of the two classes. So for instance, if you imagine the, I, I, w I would think one can look at this by looking at the, uh, the classification of people into classes, but I would think that these individuals who are here, uh, 
who are low on inattentiveness and high on hyperactivity are probably part of the high class over here, high class with a relatively low inattentiveness value, inattentiveness factor value. I think those people here, they're high up here, so they fit nicely in this for these items, but for the, these items where it's lower, it's probably captured by lower factor value for those individuals. And from this analysis, you get the estimated, not only the estimated class probabilities for each individual in each class, but also the estimated factor scores within each class. So you can really go in and take a look at how people shift between classes, say in this case, in your real analysis. Do you have any interpretation for the two factors? I mean, uh, uh, medical interpretation, what type of uh, variables are that? So uh, the question is, do we have an interpretation for what the factors are here? Yes, uh, the, the classes is, is clear, but the factors, what would that be? I mean, it's, it's severity or something, but uh, why two and uh, what, yeah, it, what it, does this ca capture? Yeah, the, the factors, if, you, if we don't have the fact, estimated factor loading matrix, but it's essentially you have nine variables of the inattention, nine variables of the hyperactivity. So you have a simple structure where the nine inattentiveness items load on, on that first factor and the nine hyperactivity on the second, and there are no cross loadings. So it is severity of the two different kinds. Comes out very, very nicely. Folks, it's five minutes past five, and you have su survived the day very well. Thank you.